tuning in, whether it's on Crowdcast or our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. In these strange, strange times, we're thrilled to be able to present virtual editions of our programs and use live streaming to create a kind of digital stage to serve Town Hall's community of curious and engaged Seattleites. Folks from well beyond Seattle too, we're finding. Like everyone who's willing to stare or talk into their computers right now, some for the first time, though not, I believe, tonight's guest, I wanna thank Robert Reich for helping us keep the conversation aloft in Seattle and at Town Hall. Unfortunately, tonight's broadcast will not feature closed captioning services, but how, however, captions will be available once this video has been uploaded to our YouTube page, which we will do really quickly. Upcoming events include tomorrow evening's appearance by the Washington Post advice columnist R. Eric Thomas on his life lived on the margins of mainstream society, Joe Serencioni on the future of U.S. nuclear policy, Dar Jamal bearing witness to the end of ice in Antarctica, uh, as well as another installment of our Earshot Jazz Live at the Forum series this Saturday night, and a very few, uh, I'm sorry, a few very exciting confirmations to be announced in uh, the coming days. We're adding new programs every day, in fact, as well as new events being released on podcast, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. In short, if you poke around the media tab on our homepage, over the coming weeks, Town Hall will continue to provide not only ways to stay plugged in, but plenty more rabbit holes for you to climb down. As for tonight's program, Professor Reich will speak for 30 or so minutes, after which um, I'll join you again to pose questions uh, from all of you in our audience. We'll be selecting questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions our speaker answers first by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that our speaker will be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Civics at Town Hall is supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and it's truly our members who are the lifeblood of making our place possible. Finally, everything you've heard is true. Town Hall and, not, and the nonprofit community at large are under significant strain right now, and we hope you will consider a gift during this difficult time by making a donation, by clicking on the donate button on your screen, depending on your platform, or by becoming a member. You can also make a donation online or text the words Town Hall to 44321 to give. Also, our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and could use your support as well. If you're interested both in supporting local independent bookstores and deepening your understanding of tonight's topic by picking up a copy of the system, we hope you will use the link on our live stream page to purchase tonight through Elliott Bay Book Company. All right then. Robert Reich is the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley and a senior fellow at the Bloom Center for Developing Economies. Uh, he served in the administrations of Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and most notably, of course, as the Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration from 1993 to 1997. For his service, Time Magazine named him one of the 10 most effective cabinet secretaries of the 20th century. As an author, his articles have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal, and he writes weekly columns for The Guardian and Newsweek. He is also a founding editor of The American Prospect, the co-founder of Inequality Media, and the co-creator of the award-winning film Inequality for All, as well as the Netflix original Saving Capitalism. He has written 17 books, including bestsellers like 2007's Super Capitalism, 2010's Aftershock, 2012's Beyond Outrage, Saving Capitalism for the Many, Not the Few from 2015, and Economics in Wonderland from 2017, and The Common Good, which was the occasion of his last visit to Town Hall just nine-ish months ago. Nine-ish months, but a whole world away. Professor Reich and I were speaking earlier about the special connection he enjoys with Seattle audiences and we at Town Hall with him. Not even a pandemic, it seems, can keep him from joining us again. Robert Reich's book, The System, Who Rigged It and How We Fix It is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Reich. Well, thank you so much, Ware. And thank all of you uh, for, I was gonna say, coming out on a Seattle night, but you haven't really come out on the night. Uh, you haven't really come out of your, of hopefully your own comfort of your, of your house. Uh, you and I are among the most privileged people in America right now in terms of this pandemic. I don't mean because you're listening to me. I mean, because we are most of us remote workers. We can continue to make a living by dialing in or 
by connecting somehow to the world out there. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is the themes in my book. Now, obviously, I wrote the book before the pandemic. But sadly, at least sadly to me, and I'm sure sadly to most of you, the themes that I develop in the book, themes about power and class and what the free market really stands for, are themes that are revealed most starkly and have been revealed more starkly than I ever expected they would be in this terribly tragic, dark pandemic that we are living through. And believe me that, you know, even though we are privileged because you are probably a remote worker as I am, it is still, and I don't mean to minimize the sense of disorientation and stress and anxiety that we all feel. I might go one step further and risk sounding a bit partisan by saying that a pandemic would be bad enough, but a pandemic with Donald Trump at the helm of our nation at least makes me more stressful, more anxious, and more disoriented than ever. So let me begin uh, by saying something about the class structure that this pandemic is revealing. Because in my book, I talk a lot about, as I have talked about before, to Seattle, to Seattle Town Hall, which, by the way, I, I love. I, I miss being with you. Uh, I, I just enjoy the Seattle Town Hall so much. And as Ware said, I was, I was there only nine months ago. It feels like an eternity. That's one thing about this pandemic. It has changed in distorted time. Don't you, don't you think that? Don't you feel that? Uh, there was a time called BC before the coronavirus, and now we're moving into after the beginning of the coronavirus. But when I was last there with you in the Seattle Town Hall, I talked a little bit about some of these themes, but I want to develop them as I develop them in the book and talk about the pandemic as revealing our class society in ways we have not seen it revealed before. Maybe one way to begin and to talk about this is to, is to say that besides the remote workers, and remote workers roughly are 40% of the American workforce, 40% of all of us are now working remote, remotely, and we are collecting paychecks. And we are also, most of us, continue to get employer-provided health care. Again, we are the privileged ones. Uh, but there is another group of workers, or at least former workers, who are now jobless. They are unemployed. We know that according to new claims for unemployment insurance that these people total around 17 million, but even that is an underestimate because those are only the people whose claims have actually been processed. My best estimate is that we have probably now about 20 to 25 million people who are unemployed in the United States. And if the present rate of joblessness continues to grow, the same as it has grown over the last month, we may find ourselves within the next two months with 25 to 30% of our entire workforce without work, unemployed. That's as high, if not higher, a rate than we saw during the Great Depression of the 1930s. No one ever expected we would be here. But I want to emphasize to you that this particular high degree of unemployment and this recession, and we are almost certainly in a recession, is not due to the typical reasons we get into high unemployment and recessions, and that is you have a asset bubble, a housing bubble, a debt bubble blowing up, like we saw in 1929 leading to the Great Depression, 
or in 2008 leading to the Great Recession. Uh, this is really nothing like those. This is a huge economic calamity for many, many Americans because of the pandemic, because it is necessary for so many of us to stay home, because it is necessary to shut the economy down for the good of all, uh, to slow down the spread of this virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals. You in Seattle, in the state of Washington, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have been one of the centers of this pandemic. Now, what do we do for this huge percentage of the workforce who is unemployed? Uh, I think the only thing we can do is get money into their hands as fast as possible. Uh, there are many people I hear from uh, in a kind of free-floating focus group who are desperate. Uh, they don't have any money. One thing about the American workforce is that 78%, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And that's not because they don't want to save. It's not because they're spendthrifts. It's because they don't earn enough to allow them to save. So that once those paychecks stop coming in, they are in very grave financial danger. Not only are they in danger, as are many of the rest of us from this pandemic, but they are in great financial danger because they can't pay the rent. They may not be able to pay their mortgage. Already we see a rising tide of late mortgage payments and late rental payments. Uh, they may not be able to buy food for their family. So we've got to get money to them. Uh, Congress has made an effort and there have been three coronavirus, they call them stimul stimulus bills. They're not really stimulus bills. We don't want to stimulate the economy. We can't stimulate the economy. We can't get jobs back right now. No, they're called stimulus bills, but they are three bills that might better be called survival bills because they're, they're attempts to help people survive. They're not very good. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the biggest reason is that that money is still not getting out to most people. Uh, those unemployment checks that were supposed to be enlarged by $600 a week, uh, most state unemployment offices are overwhelmed. Uh, they can't really manage it. A uh, huge number of people uh, in this country have not been able to get any anything that was promised. Small businesses were also promised some relief. Uh, they have had a very hard time getting something. Uh, it's called the Payroll Protection Plan. Uh, but that money is going through the Small Business Administration and then through the big banks and many banks are not cooperating and there's a lot of confusion and I'm tempted to blame the incompetence of the Trump administration. But I'll tell you something, having served as Secretary of Labor, been a cabinet member in a huge government in, of the United States, I can tell you how difficult it is to do something quickly. The other, and just so that we're all together on this. I've talked about two classes of people so far. One, the fortunate or the relatively fortunate. We are the remote workers. Uh, the other class I've mentioned, the people who've lost their jobs, who are still waiting and desperate uh, for money to just simply survive. There's a third class of people I want to talk to you about. And these are, these are called essential workers essential. They are essential. They're essential because we need them so desperately. They are on the front lines. They are nurses and home care providers and warehouse workers. I'm going to talk about them in a moment. Delivery people, they're grocery workers and drugstore workers, bus drivers. They're attendants in homeless shelters. Uh, they're sanitation workers. They're also in the armed forces, they're, they're in the Navy. Many of these workers, they are essential, but here's the problem. We're not protecting them as we should. We're failing them, not as we're failing the unemployed. We're failing the essential workers because so many of them don't have the protective gear they need. The richest nation in the world, we still can't find masks for all our nurses and our hospital 
orderlies and others in hospitals and the front lines. Uh, we, can't, we still can't find the gowns. We still can't find what they need to protect themselves. Uh, that is a scandal. And I will get back to that. And if I don't cover it, I'm sure you will have your questions. But they don't also, many of them do not get paid sick leave if they do get sick. Uh, they don't have, too many of them don't even have health insurance. Many of them uh, don't have paid family leave. Many of them are working too close to the minimum wage. Now, we're celebrating these people. I don't know about where you are, but where I am, uh, you know, at eight o'clock, uh, everybody shouts and, and applauds from their own bunkers for these healthcare workers, especially and these other essential workers. Uh, we may applaud them, we may treat them as heroes, uh, but we are not actually treating them as heroes. We are failing them deeply and profoundly. Too many of them are succumbing to this pandemic. And finally, let me talk about another group, the last group in this kind of new class structure that we are seeing, which is really a reflection of the old class structure that we had before the pandemic, but it takes a different manifestation now. Uh, the other group are people who are, well, I'll call them the crowded in place workers. And they're not really workers, many of them. They are simply forced by the nature of who they are and how the government is treating them to be crowded together in very dangerous circumstances. Here, I'm talking about people who are in prison, inmates. I'm talking about migrant workers and homeless workers and migrants who are being detained by the government. Uh, people who are in shelters, who are homeless people, who are in shelters, but the shelters are overcrowded and, and dangerous. I'm talking about Native Americans and farm workers and many people who are already at the margins of society. Many of these people can't shelter in place because they don't even have shelters to begin with. We don't talk about them enough in my view, in my opinion, and yet they are part of the pattern that we are seeing. They're part of this class structure in America that is becoming ever, ever more obvious to us all. Now, what do we do about all this? And, and are we going to change our ways? I'm often asked by people, having gone through the pandemic, assuming that there is an end to this, that we come out at the other side, uh, are we going to feel differently? Will we say to ourselves, well, we, we really see how many people have lost their employer provided health care. And so we really do need Medicare for all. Or I see how, how absolutely minimal our safe social safety nets are, particularly compared to other nations, other advanced nations. We have almost nothing. I, I understand maybe people will start saying to themselves, I understand why we need to have real social safety nets. We need to have a, uh, an unemployment insurance system that is really, really uh, takes care of most of our workers instead of a, a small minority. We really do have to have universal basic income. We really do have to have guaranteed employment. The list goes on and on. This is a list that is considered to be a list, at least until now, proposed and promoted by progressives, by people who are on the left. But maybe, maybe when we come out of all of this, maybe we'll see that we are all in need of this. Maybe we'll see, even those of us who are remote workers, remote workers, some remote workers are, yes, they're managerial and CEOs and executives and professionals, but some remote workers are still very insecure. Uh, they're working from contract to contract. They're not sure where they're, when their next contract will be renewed. So, so actually, in total, it is a vast majority of us who now are subjected daily to the palpable insecurities of American life. And I want to stress this point. No advanced nation treats its workers as badly 
as does the United States. No advanced nation on earth tolerates the degree of inequality we tolerate, inequality of income and wealth and political power. No advanced nation on earth would deny its people paid time off, sick leave, family medical leave. No nation, no other advanced nation provides no health insurance for so many of its people. Our workers are subjected to the harshest form of capitalism in the world, the richest nation in the world. Most of our workers have not had a raise, if you adjust for inflation, in 40 years. And most workers before the pandemic saw that no matter how hard they worked, they were not getting ahead. Other nations have much stronger trade union movements. We used to have a fairly strong union movement when I was a kid in the 1950s and even through the 60s and even through much of the 70s. We had strong labor unions, but now only 6.4% of Americans belong to a union. So you lose the countervailing power. You lose the voice. You lose the political ability to gain the kind of protections I'm talking about. Now, I don't want to pick on anybody. The reason I entitled uh, this book, my book, here it is. There it is. The reason I entitled this book, The System, is precisely because I want people to see this as a system, not just in economic terms, but in political economic terms. That is, you can't talk about a free market and assume that it's distinct from government and politics because how is the market constructed? How do the rules of the market, how are created? How is the market enforced? Those rules are created and enforced by government. They are created and recreated and changed by government. And the real question is not, do you want government or the free market? The real question, which becomes even more potent, powerful, poignant in a time of pandemic, is who has most influence over the rules of the market? When you take a systemic approach, when you think of it as a system, then you understand that the notion of a meritocracy is totally mythology. Instead of assuming that people are paid what they are so-called worth, quote unquote, in the market, you begin understanding, and more and more Americans are coming to understand, that what people are paid is not a matter of their worth, because the market is a construct. The market is constructed increasingly and influenced increasingly by the people who are wealthier and wealthier, who have disproportionate influence politically on how that market functions. So unless you understand the system as a system, you begin thinking that meritocracy is real when it's not. You begin believing that corporate social responsibility is a phenomenon other than public relations when it's not. Unless you see the system as a system, you don't understand the importance of power. Power. Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Power is the issue that we need to focus on and talk about. Because it's true in economic terms, income and wealth are not zero-sum games. Just because one person has a lot of income or a lot of wealth doesn't mean that other people have to have less or low income or wealth, no. But power is a zero sum game because certain people have it, other people don't have it. Everybody cannot have power. And when you conjoin wealth and power, you actually begin to see what has created the system we have right now. Now, 
for those of you in Seattle, I'm going to say something that I and I, I I say it with with humility and caution because I don't want to insult anybody, and I don't want anybody to feel that I am vilifying anybody. But I'm using Jeff Bezos simply as an example. Now, since the pandemic began, Jeff Bezos's wealth has increased by twenty four billion dollars. I'll say that again. Since the pandemic began, Jeff Bezos' wealth has increased by $24 billion. Now, it's not because he's a bad person or a good person. It's because of the way the system is organized. He has and owns 11% of Amazon. Amazon, because of what has happened to this country over the last month or three weeks, month, Amazon has become extraordinarily important and even wealthier than it was before. Amazon's stock price has gone up, even though the stock prices of many other companies, most other companies, in fact, almost every other company has gone down. And so one might say Jeff Bezos is certainly entitled to earn $24 billion more than he had before. Well, yes, in a way that's true, but Bear in mind also that Amazon has a great deal of market power. And that market power, in turn, depends upon what? It depends upon patents and copyrights and trademarks enforced by the government. It depends upon the government failing to enforce, some might say, antitrust laws. It depends upon Amazon being able to lobby for a huge tax cut, which big corporations received in December of 2017, so that Amazon, notwithstanding its extraordinary earnings, paid last year almost nothing in taxes. Amazon's warehouse workers, many of them are in trouble. They are getting infected in this pandemic. And on Tuesday, the first Amazon warehouse worker that I know of died from the coronavirus. A fellow named Chris Small, who was a former manager assistant, he was fired recently by Amazon after leading workers at the JFK 8 warehouse in Staten Island, Amazon's warehouse. And he was fired because he led workers in a walkout. Workers were demanding temporary shutdowns of the warehouse for cleaning after multiple employees tested positive for the coronavirus. Now, the reason I say all of this is, again, not to pick on Jeff Bezos and not to pick on, on Amazon. Uh, it's to reveal something about the system, the system. Because we now live in a system in which workers have very, very little power. And so that when you have a warehouse that may be dangerous, Workers don't have the power to demand that it be closed down for cleaning. Workers don't have any rights. Amazon can fire somebody who leads workers in a resistance. The system does allow Amazon to do what it's doing in order to maximize shareholder returns. And as it's now organized, the system is organized around maximizing shareholder returns. That is the only legitimate purpose in the current system of a corporation. Why is that? Well, as I explain in the book, it begins really in the 1970s and 1980s. And it begins with corporate raiders like Carl Icahn. Not incidentally, a good friend of Donald Trump. Carl Icahn and other corporate raiders 
who saw that there was a possibility of making a lot of money by threatening to take over companies that they said were underperforming. Underperforming. And what they meant by underperforming was that the companies they thought could generate much more revenue, much higher profits, much higher share prices by firing workers or at least getting rid of the fat. The butcher metaphors of modern management became very fashionable. Many companies abandon their hometowns if they could set up shop cheaper, more cheaply elsewhere. They busted unions. They outsourced abroad. They automated. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm simply suggesting that once the corporate raiders had exploited, and I'll use that term exploited advisedly, that is, they saw an opportunity to make a lot of money. Once they actually exploited that opportunity, they theoretically made the system more efficient, but the word efficiency itself hides something very important because all of the workers who were fired, all of the workers who lost their jobs and their pay, all of the unions that were busted and the union members who no longer had representation, all of the communities that lost their businesses, their corporations, their places of work, all of them were not counted in the term efficiency. Efficiency only pertained to maximizing the use of these set of resources. The social costs, if you will, of this entire phenomenon were not considered. And from the 1980s onward, we all accepted this as a necessary part of the system going forward. Academic treatises, economists, others who looked at the system said, well, this is, this always, this is going to make America better and stronger, and the efficiency gains are going to go to all of us. Well, not true. The efficiency gains went to some of us, people at the top. The efficiency gains did not go to the workers. A recent study showing where the stock market gains of the last 15 to 20 years have come from primarily, not from improvements in productivity, not from research and development, not from new investments in the business. No, the stock market gains primarily over the last 15 or 20 years have come from workers. That is, there has been a redistribution from what workers would have received had we been in the older economy to what workers receive over the last 15 or 20 years, which is why the median wage has been stagnant, which is why so many people have been so frustrated, which is why the class structure in America has become more rigid and inequality wider than in any other country, which is why you have people who are billionaires, who have extraordinary wealth, but also extraordinary political power, which is why a, com a company like Amazon can basically go around the United States saying to states and localities, look, if you give us tax breaks, more and more tax breaks, uh, we might consider our second headquarters in your particular vicinity. Setting off a bidding war, you see, of tax benefits. We have in this country socialism. We have socialism for the rich and harsh capitalism for everybody else. That coronavirus act, the third one, the big one, the $2.2 trillion one that went through Congress signed by President Trump two weeks ago. Well, you look at that particular coronavirus legislation and ask yourself, who were the great beneficiaries? Who were the winners? Who were the losers? The greatest beneficiaries 
Not surprisingly, given what I've suggested to you about power, were the companies, the big companies that got bailouts, that got a kind of $500 billion slush fund that's going to be backstopping the Fed in providing something in the order of $4 trillion worth of Fed buybacks of corporate debt. It's going to be the big companies whose debt is being bought back by the Fed. These are the same companies, by the way, who over the last several years have gone deeper into debt to buy back their shares of stock in order to get the shares of stock higher so that big investors and top executives can do better and better. You see the problem. You see the bailout. It's not that different from the bailout of the big banks in 2008. And who's being shafted? Well, you know, $1,200 per adult, that's really not very much. And as I said before, unemployment benefits are not getting through to the people who absolutely need them. And by the way, did you notice that the big companies, the biggest companies, the Fortune 500 companies, they were exempted from the coronavirus bill just before that. They were exempted from the requirement that they provide paid sick leave. Why were they exempt? Does it have anything to do with political power? Power. There's that word again. Well, I can see that my time is coming to an end, at least in terms of this presentation. But it's appropriate that we end on this issue of power because my hope is that after enduring the coronavirus, assuming that we do endure it, assuming that we come out on the other side, I think another aspect of our public conversation is going to be about power. Right now, some of the most powerful people in this country, CEOs, bank presidents, are trying to influence Donald Trump to proclaim that the country will be open for business again May 1st. Now, believe me, a president does not have that power. That power is up to the governors to declare when this emergency is over. But even when the governors do declare it over, the question remains, is it over? Who has an interest in making it end earlier than perhaps it should end? Do the powerful in this country and the wealthiest in this country who are sitting on a huge percentage of the value of the stock market, do they have perhaps a different trade-off between getting the economy going again and maintaining public health than the rest of us have? And if that's the case, are the voices of the rest of us being heard? And will they be heard in terms of making this trade-off? And by the way, it's not even, and I will end on this note, it's not even technically and as a matter of reality, a trade-off. Because if we open, reopen, as it's called, the American economy too soon, then the chances that we're going to have another upsurge in the coronavirus and COVID-19 increase. And if that happens, then the economic recovery will not happen for a much, much longer time in the future. So don't fall for this simplistic view of a trade-off, even though that is what the president and a lot of CEOs and a lot of major investors are pushing for. My hope and my largest and most significant hope for all of you is that you stay safe and that all of your loved ones stay safe. And my hope for this country is that we learn a great deal 
And that learning makes us understand that our economy and our society really do depend on all of us. And that social justice is not simply an ideal for the lefties and the radicals and the progressives and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. No, that actually we all have an interest in making this country, this economy, this society work for all of us. We all have a profound interest in making the system work, in fixing the system. So on that note, I invite your questions. And Will, where that is, where if you're anywhere, where if you're aware, uh, please do chime in and, and let us have uh, questions, please. Here I am, and I guess I, I feel like I'm broadcasting to you all from somewhere deep underwater right now. Am I as blue to you, Robert, as I look to myself in the camera you're or very, not? You're, you're very blue, but I thought that was your mood. It is, well, there's Where? there's that. I've always kept it really close to the surface. At any rate, um, so the, as we discussed before, um, you know, you're the man with the crystal ball. So a lot of the questions that have emerged are about bigger issues around the pandemic and around specific kinds of questions sort of for the future. So I might at the very beginning focus specifically on a couple of questions around the system and then pivot to some of those larger or some of those other sorts of questions. So the first question comes from Michael Wong and it says, what does the power distribution look like in your ideal system and how can we work towards that ideal system? Uh, Michael and others, uh, the ideal system really doesn't have an ideal output. It has an ideal process. Uh, and let me explain that by just simply referring to the great justice, Louis Brandeis, who in the first Gilded Age made a point that is as valid today as it was then. And he said, we have a choice. We can have a great deal of wealth in the hands of a few or we can have a democracy, but we can't have both. And so my goal really is not a particular distribution. My goal is a democracy that will make the rules of our economy and the rules of our society and the rules of our safety nets and so forth uh, much more responsive to what people need. Um, on a related question, although this sort of straddles the line, COVID and structural, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, what strategies do you think the powerful might use to preserve their power? That question comes from Tony Usabelli. Well, Tony, uh, the, the powerful uh, use uh, several strategies, uh, and they have used historically, particularly over the last several hundred years, and there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, one strategy uh, is to use what I call market fundamentalism. It's like the divine right of kings in the 17th century. It's to say that the market knows best. Uh, and as I've suggested to you, uh, to create a kind of a, a mythology uh, that the market is somehow natural and inevitable and exists separate from the political institutions that create it. Another that elites, that the oligarchy, and I use the term oligarchy advisedly, uh, it is uh, from the ancient Greek. Uh, it does mean a society in which the vast amount of wealth and power are in very few hands. And that's where we are heading very rapidly. Uh, but the other thing that the oligarchy uh, does uh, historically is to divide and conquer, uh, to keep everybody else angry at each other, uh, very divided, so that we don't come together and look upward and see where all the power and wealth went. Uh, we just basically get angry with each other, uh, immigrants versus Native Americans, Native borns, Native born Americans, uh, whites versus uh, African Americans and, and Latinos, uh, we see all sorts of divisions, and I think Donald Trump uh, has exacerbated all of them. Uh, but behind those divisions is something I think it's fair to say that the oligarchy wants because it disguises the wealth and power at the top. 
Uh, and then there are a number of mythologies, and I've alluded to several of those mythologies, like corporate social responsibility. I mean, it would be lovely if corporations were socially responsible. The, the business roundtable uh, in August, last August, came together. The business roundtable is an association of the, of the most powerful uh, CEOs of the biggest companies in America. And they came together and they committed themselves uh, to not only uh, look out for the welfare of their shareholders, but also for their workers and their communities uh, with a lot of public relations surrounding it. I think the reason they did that is because they were frankly afraid of where so many Democratic candidates, particularly Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, seem to be leading the country. And so they thought that that kind of pronouncement would be very helpful. And yet it's absolute rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. Corporate social responsibility is nothing but public relations dressed up. Companies are maximizing shareholder returns. Uh, in fact, every company that signed that document uh, within, within months began either laying off workers or, in fact, GM endured the longest strike in modern GM history because it would not share any of its newfound profits with its workers. Hmm. Where? This is a... This is a structure question that is also rooted in the current moment. Uh, Joseph Sunga asks, and excuse, forgive me in advance for butchering a pronunciation. There's another butcher image, by the way. What do you think about Chamath pa Paliapatiya, his comments on letting corporations fail? Shouldn't we focus our stimulus on Main Street only, citizens impacted and small businesses, instead of uh, large corporate bailouts in this moment? Yes, I'm very much against large corporate bailouts. Uh, but uh, I do think it would be very useful if we could come up with a mechanism uh, to provide direct funding to companies only for their payrolls, only for their payrolls, uh, through a direct deposit. Uh, mm -hmm. Your Congresswoman Jayapal, a wonderful member of Congress, uh, I, was, uh, I appeared before at the Seattle Town Hall with her, uh, I guess it was nine months ago. Uh, mm -hmm. She has come up with this idea, and I, in fact, uh, did a Facebook Live with her this morning on it. Uh, and I talked to Bernie Sanders on another Facebook Live this afternoon about it. <laughs> so I've been talking about it all day. Uh, uh, so, yes, I think that we can and should uh, provide uh, money to companies, but just to maintain their payrolls, not to do anything else. Uh, and her idea, I think it's a very, very good idea, is that um, it's, it's based on the last three months. Uh, and the IRS has all this data. Uh, the IRS knows what the last three months of payroll was. Uh, and, and, and you just provide it for the next three months. Uh, and then if it turns out afterwards, and you can easily audit these companies, if it turns out that a company uh, did not do that, then you claw back all that money. This is a related question from a person who wants to be known simply as guest. The Paycheck, Gu Paycheck Guarantee Act is gaining support and would help traditional employees. However, it ignores large numbers of gig workers, freelancers, domestic workers, undocumented workers, artists, musicians, independent contractors, et cetera. What's the best way to get help to them? Uh, well, I talked to Congresswoman Jayapal this morning about that, and her proposal does cover contract workers and gig workers and others. So if you want the details, just go to her website. Very cool. So I think it looks to me like a lot of the questions now pivot to sort of general help us, Bob. So I'm going to sort of uh, move through some of them. Speaking of health insurance, how do we uncouple that from employment? What is the path to, um, that is, what is the path toward universal health care? That's a question from Marco. Uh, well, Marco, I think the only path to universal health care is through uh, something like a single payer. Uh, and the easiest single payer that's on the table is Medicare for all. Now, Bernie Sanders, God bless him. Uh, that was what he put on the table in 2016. When he did, almost nobody was in favor. Uh, but he, because of his tenacity, and if Bernie Sanders is anything, it is tenacious. Uh, he built the case. He reiterated it over and over. Uh, and uh, your Congresswoman Jayapal also did that, and she deserves a great deal of credit. Uh, and so right now uh, we have, in fact, even before the pandemic, uh, 
uh, by many polls, a majority of Americans were in favor of Medicare for all. Uh, I would say that after the pandemic, when so many millions of people have lost their employer-provided health care, it may be a no-brainer, more than it was before, more easily acceptable to more people than it was before. Now, that doesn't tell us how we get through the political thicket, because if you understand any, you know, what I've been talking about in terms of power, uh, there is a lot of power at the top and a lot of power to resist Medicare for all, but I think it is absolutely inevitable. We are paying almost 20% of our entire national product before, before the pandemic for health care, and we had the worst results of any industrial, a post-industrial advanced country. Uh, it's absurd. I meant to mention before we made this swivel uh, that since there isn't time to get to all of the points that you've made in the system, this is a great opportunity to plug that, everyone. There is a buy the book link at the bottom of the page that will take you directly to LA Bay Book Company, one of those Main Street um, employers that uh, that our last questioner, I think it was Marco, uh, uh, mentioned in his question. So moving you know, back to- I, I was just, I just noticed, I've never given a lecture or a book talk before uh, where there is an actual, a button right yeah. there under my mm -hmm. face that mm -hmm. says yeah. buy the book. I mean, that's <laughs> the most amazing thing I've ever in life. You can just well, go right there <laughs> on your screen and you can buy the book. Well, by making the content free and accessible to folks, we wanted to make sure that we were, um, that is one way that people can fulfill their sort of the commitment, the tithing that they would do by showing up and throwing down five bucks at town hall, walk away with a copy of the book tonight if you all can. Heaven knows we all have time right now. Or, okay, that's not a fair assumption. Many of us have time to engage and to read it right now. Let me rumble back onto the questions for a moment. Um, let's see. Uh, Peg Acterman writes, uh, since you are in higher education, what do you think will happen regarding colleges in the future? We've seen the good and the bad of remote and online learning. Well, it's interesting, Peg. I, uh, I would have said before the pandemic began, uh, I would have said that online learning was a failure. Uh, a lot of companies got into it, uh, a lot of universities invested in it, uh, but there was no substitute for the personal touch. I mean, I love teaching. I love to be in a classroom. I love to see students. I love to interact with students. Uh, I'm a believer that education is not just about hearing or reading, it is about thinking. And it's very difficult to get people provoked enough to think in a lecture and particularly online. Now I say to you that I was there before the pandemic, but like many of you, I have been impressed, maybe that's the word, with how much is possible to do online. Now, I don't think it's a substitute. I still think we need people who are going to be there with students, but it may be possible to do more online lecturing supplemented by small group discussions with professors and with assistant professors. I am very, very leery of giving more responsibility to adjuncts and to lecturers because they already are bearing too much of the brunt. Uh, it's, it's, it's just the mini class structure of America transported over to the university. Mm -hmm. um, what strategy should we pursue to assure vote by mail in November and full funding of the USPS? Is it even politically possible? That's a question from Joan. Well, it certainly is politically possible. Uh, I worry a little bit about the time constraints. Uh, now, it's clear to me, and again, I don't want uh, to insult those of you who are Republicans who are watching me, but it's clear to me that in general, the Republican Party does not want people to vote. Uh, the Electoral results of the last, certainly the last 24, 28 years have suggested that the more people who vote out of a potential population of eligible voters, uh, the more likely it is that Democrats get elected. The fewer people who vote, uh, the more likely it is that Republicans get elected. Uh, and so uh, it, it wasn't surprising to me that Donald Trump and many other Republicans opposed voting by mail, oppose voting by mail, even now, 
the Wisconsin Republican Party, which should be ashamed of itself. I mean, how can you actually call yourself a representative of the public and the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of your state and do what Wisconsin Republicans have done? Nonetheless, nonetheless, it is critically important that we have mail-in votes it's critically important that we make election day a national holiday. And it's critically important for a b many, many reasons that we preserve the United States post office. Um, similarly, is there a viable path? I should say Lawson's question is, is there a viable path to end the electoral college? Well, I think there is a viable path. I, again, I don't know that it's viable. In fact, I doubt it's viable before November. Mm -hmm. uh, and that viable path, uh, and I did a video on this uh, a few years ago, if any of you is interested in, uh, it's, it's, it's called Abolish the Electoral College. It doesn't, it, the, the purpose of the video is not to suggest that we can, we can have a constitutional amendment abolishing the Electoral College. That would be much too difficult. And I would not even propose that we put that effort into it. But there is an interstate compact. Uh, more and more states have joined the interstate compact. Uh, and put very, very simply, the provision of the uh, of the compact is a state says, look, if we get enough other states to come up with the 270 votes that you need to elect a president in the electoral college, we, our state, will award our electors to the winner of the popular vote. Uh, and that simple provision, uh, if it is adopted by enough states representing 270 electoral votes, uh, that would do it. And we're, we're on the way. Again, not by November, but we're on the way. Um, a handful of questions upcoming are very political in nature. So forgive me as I go into Holly's question. It was massively upvoted though, Bob. So just trust me on this. Um, does Amy McGrath have a chance to beat Mitch McConnell? If so, how? And if not, why? Uh, yes. Um, Mitch McConnell is very unpopular in Kentucky. Uh, I know this not only from the polls, but actually every chance I get, I go to a red state when I am invited, uh, usually by students. Uh, and I've gone to Kentucky over the last few years, a number of times, uh, and they really dislike him. I mean, uh, last summer, for example, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, was greeted. I, I mean, he actually, there was a delegate, a delegation of, of minors uh, from Kentucky, from Eastern Kentucky, who had black lung disease. Uh, and wanted Mitch McConnell's attention uh, with regard to a piece of legislation. And McConnell barely gave them the light, the light of day. He basically kicked them out of his office. Uh, <laughs> he's, he has a reputation of, of being somebody they dislike. The only hope Mitch McConnell has is that Kentucky went overwhelmingly for Donald Trump in 2016. And if Trump is at the head of the ticket, uh, Don, uh, Mitch McConnell hopes that uh, his coattails will be big enough to carry Mitch McConnell back into the Senate. Um, and then John Morgan wants to know if we can really expect Joe Biden to address crucial challenges we face in this moment. I, I believe so. Uh, you know, I don't know Joe Biden. Uh, I mean, I feel as though I know him. Uh, I know everybody, maybe everybody in America who knows Joe Biden, but I don't, I've not personally met him. I, I am, Convinced, though, that he's at least a smart enough politician to know that he cannot win if he doesn't have young people voting. He can't win if he doesn't have working class people who feel that he's going to give them something that they need. He can't win if he doesn't have progressives behind him. In other words, he can't win simply by hoping to pull off uh, enough uh, women from the ranks of Republicans who supported Donald Trump. That's not going to get him the White House. That's not going to get him uh, a victory over Donald Trump. And I think he knows that. I hope he knows that. Uh, a lot of questions now are good wrap up questions, sort of where do we go from here? But I actually found a couple of really niche ones that I might want to pose to you to pull out, you know, your deep policy wonkery, Professor, Professor Wright. So, um, Marco, again, has the question, well, that's not cool, asking, answering two from him. But at any rate, 
There are laws in place that allow renters and mortgage holders to defer payments, but there doesn't seem to be anything to pause the interest payments to the investors that hold the mortgage investments. Is there some way to fix that? Uh, yeah, well, that, uh, Marco, like your former question, uh, it's a good question, and it, and it does raise a, a slightly larger issue. The banks right now are getting money essentially free of charge. The Fed is pumping huge amounts of money through the banking system. There is not the slightest reason why the Fed should be charging up, why the banks, the banks should be charging any interest at all on any of their loans or even on any of the loans that are not fully paid on time. Uh, the Fed, again, is making it so easy for the big banks that I think the question has got to be raised, why are the banks imposing any fees, late fees, on anybody for anything? Um, just a few last ones. Uh, Frida wants to know that Bloomberg News, or actually uh, argues that Bloomberg News tweeted a great deal about social unrest that will arise from this period. Do you think the U.S. will experience social unrest due to marginalized people who feel they've been treated unfairly? Well, we've already experienced social unrest, and that culminated in the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump uh, is the embodiment of social unrest. Donald mm. Trump exploited and took advantage of the angers and fears and anxieties of so many people who felt that no matter how hard they worked, they couldn't get ahead. And he talked again and again in 2016. He and Bernie Sanders, interestingly, both talked again and again about the game being rigged against average people. Now, Donald Trump was obviously a Trojan horse for the oligarchy. I'm, I mean, he still is hiding it. I mean, there's, there's a kind of two-facedness, at least two-facedness to Donald Trump. On the one hand, he tells his followers, most of them working class, most of them white working class, he tells them that he's their, their great their great leader, that he can do no wrong. And at the other side, he, in private councils, uh, CEOs uh, with people like Jamie Dimon, uh, who calls himself, by the way, a Democrat, uh, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, he tells all of these people uh, he'll get them more tax cuts if he's re-elected, another big tax cut for the rich and for your corporations, more regulatory rollbacks. In other words, he maintains this two-facedness when in fact the real face of Donald Trump is the oligarch, the Trojan horse for the oligarchy. And so, so what, uh, what, what, what Joe Biden has got to do is convinced enough of the working class that that is the case. Mm -hmm. And that Joe Biden actually is not a Trojan horse for the oligarchy. Joe Biden is actually going to improve the lives of most working people. The Democratic Party, over the last 25, 30 years, although I'm a Democrat, I worked in a Democratic administration, I'm proud of what we did. But the Democratic Party, when it comes to power, wealth and power, the Democratic Party really has not distinguished itself that much from the Republican Party on the issues of wealth and power, on reforming the structure of the system. It's an important point. Um, not that the rest haven't been extremely important too. Um, just a couple more questions. Which countries would you say are good examples of the way our democracy might be structured? Anywhere we can look well, to? Well, I, I mean, there, there, there are a number of countries. Uh, you, you don't have to travel too far to the north from where you are to be in a country uh, called Canada, uh, which has a national health system. Uh, it has many of the uh, safety net provisions that we would find so radical in this country or that have been called uh, and assumed to be so radical and left-leaning in this country. Uh, Canada does pretty well for itself, I think. Uh, there are countries in, in Europe, Northern Europe especially, uh, and the usual, the Nordic countries uh, are brought up all the time. Uh, I spent uh, part of last year in Sweden, and what interested me is I kept hearing from people in the United States, we can't possibly uh, be Sweden, because Sweden Sweden is, a, is a, just a homogeneous country. It's all these tall Vikings, you know, they're all white and they're all Vikings. 
Uh, well, actually, it turns out uh, that Sweden is very uh, much, uh, there's much more diversity in Sweden than you would expect. Racial diversity, ethnic diversity. Uh, Sweden is holding on to its safety nets. It's holding on to its democratic socialism. Uh, and uh, I think if Sweden can do that, why can't we? And it's a bit of an outlier in the pandemic moment. We'll see how how well yeah, they do in that's bucking actually right. the Sweden has been an outlier. They're coming. They're coming back. They're coming back to the other, the rest of the world, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, sheltering in place. But you're absolutely right. I don't understand why they were such an outlier. Me neither. Been reading a lot about it actually. Uh, just a couple more questions here. Judith wants to know. How do you think we should balance the health and safety of our citizens during, this is a very macro question. How do you think we should balance the health and safety of our citizens during this pandemic with the with their economic needs? A corollary will be, how do we get people who are now unemployed back into the workforce? Uh, well, uh, I've covered some of this and let me just give you a very, very brief reminder. Number one, I think that Congresswoman Jaya Paul's and Bernie Sanders told me he agrees totally. And in fact, there's even a fellow, uh, a senator from Missouri, a Republican senator named Josh Hawley, uh, who's taking a very similar approach. And that is uh, you get people back to the payrolls, uh, not necessarily back to work, but back on the payrolls uh, with health insurance as fast as you possibly can. And you include, as we've talked about, you include contract workers and gig workers as well. Uh, now, what was the other part of the question? The I'm second sorry. part is, uh, oh, well, how do how do you get people who are unemployed back into the workforce? And it's just a general question about balancing health and safety with economic considerations. In this well, I, again, I'm, I, I want to urge you uh, not to fall into the trap of thinking that it's that kind of an easy trade-off. It's not, because if we go back to work too early, uh, we're going to have another resurgence of the pandemic. And that's going to make the economy, uh, it take even longer for the economy to come back. So, so we really do have to listen to the public health officials. Uh, they are the ones who understand the pattern of this pandemic better than anybody. Uh, and don't listen to uh, the CEOs or the top business leaders. Uh, they are probably the least equipped to make this trade-off and this decision. In the past, you have been a proponent of capitalism, Katie says, Katie writes, after the last three years and this pandemic experience in America, do you still believe that capitalism is worth saving? Well, uh, Katie, I think you're responding to the title of uh, <laughs> a previous book of mine. But if you read the book, you would know that I don't really believe in capitalism as, as practiced in the United States. Uh, uh, my point in that book, uh, the argument in the book was that we can't get away from certain principles of capitalism uh, in terms of uh, trades and property. Uh, and it's it, they're even there in China. They're all over the world. You, you, there is no place that practices anything other than capitalism. The question is what kind of capitalism? Uh, and the only way to save uh, a, a kind of capitalism uh, from becoming the kind of distorted, very crude and bruising capitalism we have in the United States uh, is to is to make it more humane. And that we all have an interest in doing that, not just uh, those of us who are portrayed to be on the left. Uh, we all have, and we would all do better. Even people at the top would do better uh, with a capitalism that enabled everybody else to do better. And finally, um, what kind of world should we work for after the virus? I'm most afraid that we will try to return to normalcy after this experience, much in the way that after 9-11, we didn't discuss as a nation, but were urged merely to go shop. I'm also thinking of Roy's, the pandemic is a portal, which says, and here comes a bad paraphrase, we can walk into the next world with our prejudices, our smoky skies, our databases, or we can go light and fight for a different kind of world. So, uh, what is that? What does that world look like? But I'm frankly as interested in hearing your thoughts about what, as concerned and engaged citizens, uh, we can do to try to hasten that world coming up. Uh, well, I think much of the answer to that question depends on what we will have learned from this pandemic. And when I say we, I mean uh, the people who inhabit 
uh, the United States uh, and also the people who inhabit the world. What are, what are the things that we're going to take away from this? Uh, how are our assumptions about the system going to be changed, altered? Uh, you see, in history, what we know is that very traumatic events like wars and deep depressions do change public attitudes enough to alter uh, the order that was assumed to be natural uh, or the system that was assumed to be inevitable. Uh, it is possible, and here's the only silver lining I see, honestly, on this horrible experience, and it is a horrible experience, even for those privileged uh, to be remote workers. Uh, the only silver lining is that we may learn, number one, uh, that we need government. Uh, we need a government that's competent. We need a government that's effective. Uh, we need, number two, public health. Uh, public health is something that is very important. It's related to the environment. It's related to our healthcare system. It's related to our safety nets. But public health is critically important. And number three, we are all, and this is hackneyed, but I think that we'll learn it in a very palpable way. We're all dependent on each other. Uh, our own livelihoods and our health uh, in a very real and profound way is dependent on the health of our least healthy uh, people around us. Because if they succumb to this virus uh, or other kinds of pandemics, uh, we are going to be affected almost inevitably in some way. Uh, the other I, piece of social learning I hope that goes on uh, is that, as I've said, we live in a very stratified society. Uh, we have a class system that is the most extreme of any advanced country. We treat our working people, and that is the vast majority of us, particularly those without college degrees, particularly those who are paid an hourly wage. We treat them horribly relative to any other advanced country. We are the richest nation in the world. And I hope when we, when we emerge from this, the silver lining that I aspire to, that I hope for, is that we begin to look around us at other countries, other systems, and begin to say, you know, America is not necessarily, as it's now organized, the best. We have a lot to learn from what others are doing. We don't do it all right. Is this a series of simultaneous epiphanies that happens across the country, Professor Reich, or is there a way for us to have a common reckon, a moment of common reckoning and consideration around this, to sort of have this moment of, of new understanding together? How well, we it's, a, it's a good question. I think some of it depends on leadership. That is, who occupies the Oval Office, particularly next year. Some of it uh, unfolds. I mean, if you look at some of the social changes that occurred in the 1930s that eventually brought us social security, unemployment insurance, uh, collective bargaining, uh, time and a half overtime, all of those things. Or if you look at the changes wrought by World War II that brought us the GI Bill and eventually the National Defense Education Act, uh, the federal government's uh, responsibility and role in higher education. Or if you look at the changes eventually that led to Medicare and Medicaid, uh, all of those happened not overnight, but the seeds were planted by the traumas that preceded them, uh, a sense of social solidarity that we are in a very profound and real sense, not in some airy fairy rhetorical way, that we are profoundly in the same boat together. I just want to thank you for once again joining us even in this uh, seemingly pale substitute, but it also offers a kind of an intimacy and a real connection with you, Professor Reich. Um, your intelligence 
and your experience and especially your compassion is so important for us all to hear and experience right now. And I just want to thank you from all of us in Seattle for being a part of this conversation tonight or for leading this conversation with us. And well, I want to take a moment to urge everyone who's still with us, all 872 of you, it looks like, at least on the Crowdcast, to once again hit that green button if you haven't done so yet so that you can learn more about the case that Professor Reich has built around the system. So, um, Professor Reich, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you, Ware. Thank you, Seattle Town Hall. And thank you, Seattle. Good night. We'll see you again soon. Be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.